Uh, please stand with me as I read uh, Matthew 5, verses 31 through 48. Starting in verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said that those to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord but what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Michael, if you'll come up, I'll pray for you. Lord God, um, it's a Sunday morning oftentimes when lives are changed. When you speak through your servant in a sermon, people passing the peace, um, praying afterwards, fellowshipping, having a cup of coffee. You're in our midst, God, and I praise you for that. I thank you that the veil is torn and we have access to you forever through Christ Jesus. And God, I pray that you would fill Michael with your Holy Spirit, that you would, you would speak through him this morning as he handles your word. The whole Sermon on the Mount is so heavy, convicting. It's so blunt in so many ways. There's so much, God. For us to ponder, it's so easy to hear a passage, nod our head in agreement, and try to carry on with our week. But God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be like a rock in our shoe, that we just couldn't get past it, ignore it. But we would see just how much you love us, just how much you care for us, and how committed you are in refusing to let us go. God, I love you so much, and I thank you this morning for opportunity to hear from your word. Again, I just ask that you speak through Michael, embolden and enable him. I love you, Lord God. Amen. It's a pretty weird, specific type of feeling, can't really describe it, to, to preach a message based on a sermon from Jesus, uh, if you ever want to feel unqualified for something. Um, when I was a kid, my sister and I were walking through a grocery store. Those were always good times, you know, free sugar cookies. Um, and on top of these peanut butter jars, there was a sticker I think, I don't remember clearly, but Reese's like just launched like peanut butter in a jar, you know, the, that goodness that was in the cups. Um, on top of these jars was a sticker that says, get a free Reese's right now. We thought this was incredibly nice of big peanut butter. And so we each took a sticker and we made our way to the front and handed our stickers over and got a free candy bar. And now you may be thinking, Michael, wasn't it obvious that you were supposed to buy the peanut butter to participate in the deal? Well, perhaps it was, but do you remember the part of the story where we got away with it? <laughs> and yet still you may be thinking, well, how old were you? Where were your parents at? Well, we met our parents up front after our purchase. And before you think it, I'll just confirm your guess that we got in so much trouble. Uh, we didn't have money. So mom was like, where did you get this from? And to our utter shame, we had to go back and apologize and pay for the candy. And thankfully, we did no jail time for our loophole crime. You see, it's our nature. It seems that it's in our nature to think of rules and law like a fence in a yard, where the yard is our freedom contained and restricted. And, and we will go right up to the fence and even sit on it and think we're safe as long as we don't come down on the other side. And 
We're at our very core, every one of us, rebels. How high above the speed limit can I go without getting pulled over? How much of a white lie can I get away with? How many sins can I hide? And we know in our hearts that nothing is hidden from God, but just like the religious leaders of Jesus' day and the, the interpreters of the Old Testament laws, we live in willful ignorance until we're caught or exposed and we will point to our neighbor and say, well, I'm not as bad as they are. And with this distorted perspective of law, we often look to God's law in the same sentiment of the religious leaders, and we ask, how much do I have to obey to be righteous? Do, you, do we see how that misses the mark altogether? It reduces God's law to impossible rules to follow rather than a way of human flourishing that comes, yes, from the wellspring of God's holiness, but just as much so and simultaneously from the wellspring of God's love. His law is good. His law is meant to help you, not to condemn you. His heart is for you. See, a better analogy for rule and law would be maybe instructions for how to operate an airplane. They're meant to keep you alive and well. And no one in their right mind would think that those instructions are a bad thing, holding you away from freedom to fall from the sky. Yet we are all listening to the echoed lie of Eden that begs this evil question in our heart, what is God keeping from me? Today we see Jesus get after our hearts. You know, my sister and I taking the candy bars was the result of a sin that took place back on that aisle when in our hearts we ignored this prompting that said, this is not the intention of this deal. And so we take a look at the second part of these, you've heard it said, statements. We find Jesus teaching the transformative power of love and forgiveness, urging us to go beyond mere adherence to laws by embodying a spirit of compassion and reconciliation toward others. And this is the lens through which we're going to look at our passage today. Christ here is informing his listeners of what a kingdom where he is rightly on the throne will look like where the love of God is made manifest in every citizen of that kingdom. And so this is our big idea today. Kingdom citizens are shaped by the love of God. Kingdom citizens are shaped by the love of God. As we begin, there's two things that we should note. First is the order of Jesus's points in our passage within the context of last week's verses as well. Last week we covered anger, uh, contempt, you know, murderous thoughts, and, and obsess obsessive desire, lust. And so it, it kind of follows naturally that divorce law, dishonesty, and greed would follow that. Secondly, bearing that in mind, it's important for us to also understand that Jesus isn't taking the law of the Old Testament and throwing it out only to give us a new law, leaving us yet still hopeless and of ever abiding by it sinlessly. No, Christ came, he says in Matthew 5, 17, to fulfill the law, not to abolish them. We saw that in his introduction to this section in verse 17. So what Christ is doing here is giving illustrations of what it will look like in the new kingdom. One where the law has not been abolished, but fulfilled by the king of that kingdom. The king of the universe, Jesus Christ. He's going to make every bad thing come untrue in this kingdom, including the corrupting interpretation of his holy law. So he's emphasizing the need for the earthly kingdom to be turned upside down. And he would not do that with a new law because regardless of our actions, Jesus needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. It says in John 2, 25, a hardened and corrupt heart. And Jesus knew that strict adherence to a law without genuine transformation of the heart inevitably breeds further defiance owing to the callousness it fosters within. In other words, if you, if you have no heart change and you just do the actions, it's going to lead you back to more rebellious disobedience because you'll be constantly faced with your imperfection and your heart is hardened. So what then does it look like for kingdom citizens who are shaped by the love of God? Well, first we will see that they will be a people of integrity. Let's look at verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So Jesus starts with two, you've heard it said, statements, one on divorce law and one on oaths and honesty. But before we get too far into this, I want to tread lightly by prefacing this with a few thoughts. Firstly, divorce has touched many lives in this room in one way or another. And we as a church want to be clear from the start, as heavy as this topic is, as tragic as the ripples that span generations, divorce, like any other situation in life, is not beyond the hope of the gospel of Jesus. Dallas Willard puts it like this. He says, we must resist any attempt to classify divorce as a special, irredeemable form of wickedness. It is not. It is sometimes the right thing to do, everything considered. You see, many have been shunned from the church, looked down upon and far worse. And let me be crystal clear, that is not the way of Jesus. In fact, these words, as we will see, hold profound hope. And and, and we're going to see that Jesus is so overwhelmingly for you, dear ones. And so can I just disarm any tension in the room right now? We heard this passage read, and we're all just kind of like tensing up our shoulders. Let me just say, shame is not yours to carry. Jesus carried all our shame to the cross. And this passage, as I said, is, is filled with hope. And ultimately, it's about the love of God made known to us through Jesus. And so if the voice of condemnation begins to whisper in your ear today, you can tell it in the name of Jesus to kindly shut up. The law that Jesus is referring to was originally given primarily as a means to protect the women of that day. Among the different rabbi schools of thought, there was different levels of strictness when it came to applying this law. They kind of made it their own system. Jesus here is holding to the strictest one, as we will see in a bit. But by and large, divorce is widely practiced in that time because they were just adhering to the law with the bare minimum letter. Some would allow a man to divorce his wife if she took dinner wrong. Some would allow him to divorce her if, if he saw a woman he found more attractive. So this law was meant to hinder that. This law was meant to protect women. What did divorce mean in that time? Well, for the woman, it was a ruined life. The certificate of a divorce actually did things for her. It meant that she could remarry, even though that was highly unlikely to happen. It meant that her ex-husband could not enslave her. He could not marry and divorce her again and again, as in some cultures which basically makes marriage a a joke, like not a thing. Ultimately, the intent of the Mosaic Law was to protect women from being divorced on a whim. It was a grace extended because of the hardness of their hearts. Jesus points that out in Matthew 19, when the Pharisees are trying to trap him in a political debate about this very topic. They said to him in, in Matthew 19, 7, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Did you catch that? They phrase it, Moses commanded one to give a certificate, and Jesus says aloud. They pitted Moses' command in the sense that he was commanding divorce. But Jesus denies this and points to the heart. He would then point out the significance of marriage and God's design in the book of Genesis. His design is that one woman and one man would join together and become one flesh. The two are never two again, but one until their dying day. You ever have a dad or an uncle or just any other kind of bully take a bag of your chips from you and and ask, want more, and then smashes the chips? We all agree on the math. (laughs) All right, maybe just me. uh, All right. Talk to my counselor about that sometime soon. Um, All right, so at least we can all agree on the physics and the math and science of this, that you don't have more chips, right? You have crumbles and crumbs of what was, was. See, God's picture for marriage is like a rope cord. The culture just says, cut it in half, now you have two. But God says, no, that's one severed cord. The two halves are not whole. You haven't multiplied anything. You've broken one thing. And this oneness, of course, is a, it's a picture of the gospel. That's why it matters. 
It demonstrates the oneness that Christ has with his bride, the church. What a beautiful thing that our marriages get to point to, that we can look beyond our individual wants, even in the hardest of times, and say to one another, this isn't about me or you or us. Ultimately, it's about telling the story of Jesus to the watching world. So God's desire is that divorce would not happen. And this is not a condemning statement either, but a hard truth that too many of you know firsthand that divorce sets off catastrophic ramifications in the lives of so many. God says the two are no longer two, but one, and divorce is to sever that one person. It's irreparable damage for everyone involved this side of heaven. And so, as we said, divorce is permissible. What Jesus is pointing out, that permission is a grace that we should take We should take seriously the things that God takes seriously. And we should understand the marriage covenant is not something to enter into or exit out of lightly, no matter what the culture says, and no matter how much it treats marriage like a commodity. The Gospel Coalition captured on video a conversation between John Piper, Don Carson, and the late Tim Keller. I would love to be at that table. These men are talking about the covenant of marriage, and I, I just had to share this, uh, this portion of what Tim Keller said. He says, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of Stanley Harwis, who says, you always marry the wrong person, which means even if you think you're marrying the right person, marriage is such a big deal that once you actually get together, you start to change each other. And so the basis of your marriage can't be the feeling And the basis of your marriage can't be, well, we're just kindred spirits because your spirits will go in and out of being kindred. Amen? (laughs) The thing that keeps it is the promise. I made a promise. I've made an appointment with you in the future to be your husband every year. Every year it's a covenant. You see, the heart of man then and the heart of us now says, well, technically I haven't broken God's law And we're prone to look for loopholes, which is why Jesus broaches the next subject of oaths and honesty. Look at verse 33. Again, you've heard it said to those of old, you should not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And so, again, I hope we can see the natural flow of Jesus' thought pattern because we see that he's not ultimately talking about anger, murder, lust, divorce, but the heart of mankind. The mechanism inside all of us that would cause our intents to be the same. So we see a natural flow from Christ speaking about divorce, broken covenants, to speaking about promises in general. You see, in that culture, they heard that if you swore by something besides the name of God, you weren't bound to uphold your promise. Yet again, a half-hearted or no-hearted cold obedience at a bare minimum that yields a world where no one is trusted. This is the adult version of pulling your hand from behind you and revealing your fingers were crossed. Jesus recognized their deceitful hearts. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer points out that he saw... He saw the good thing, the oath, now consumed by the lie. So in other words, their deceitful intention of their heart would have a person just use an oath or a trick to trick or manipulate their neighbor into thinking they could be trusted. That's what they were doing. It's not that saying I promise is bad. It's that the heart behind it, the qualifier. Part of being in your 30s is experiencing people older than you telling you that you're not old and people younger than you saying that you are. (laughs) Another part of being in your 30s, though, is is having conversations about which mattress has the best warranty. (laughs) What if people made products that didn't need a guarantee? But yet, what if we, as believers, did not posture ourselves in a certain light for people to believe our words? So let me ask, do you say things depending on who you are around because you think that's what they want to hear? Here's another hard, fun question. When you tell someone you will do something, do you follow through? Are you dependable? Or or would people avoid counting on you? Jesus calls for radical honesty here. He says that people who are shaped by God's love, for those people, a simple yes or no should do. He's also saying in verses 34 through 36 that you're, you're offering things that as collateral that you don't, they don't belong to you. 
You have no right to offer them as collateral. They belong to God. All you have is your word, and that should be enough. Jesus is saying that truth is not malleable. There's not degrees of truth. He's saying people shaped by the love of God don't need flowery qualifiers to their words and ultimately to their lives. People shaped by the love of God will be radically honest, uncomfortably vulnerable. And in a cultural moment that says, that has people saying that truth is what you make it, people shaped by the love of God are authentic. They're genuine. They can say, I'm a child of the Most High, and therefore I have nothing to hide. Nothing to hide, nothing to defend. I can be real about who I am because any accusation you make about me will only scratch the surface of the true darkness of my soul. Yet I have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus, and he stood in my place. He alone knows me fully as I am. He alone is my defender, and I don't have to hide behind pretense. This person, shaped by the love of God, when they say yes or no, you can believe them. And so Jesus continues this natural flow of thought. Kingdom citizens shaped by the love of God will be people of integrity. And next we see they will be people of love. Look at verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. So Jesus is now moving into a different sphere of humanity. Yet another area where this lackluster, bare minimum obedience misses the mark of a transformed heart. By unpacking the original intent of the law, he will dismantle the worldly view of love presenting something radically different. You see, the original law was about equal measures. Meant to protect you, right? These measures were handed down by a judge. But the culture had taken justice into their own hands, using technicalities to justify retaliation. And so right around here is is where we hear the objection from others or even in our own own hearts saying, yeah, but we aren't supposed to let just people walk all over us, right? Okay, well, that's correct. And it's, it's not what Jesus is getting at. Remember, this is not the new law replacing the old. This is kingdom citizens who are being shaped by God's love who would face evil head on and disarm it with generous love. Jesus is not advocating for abusers. He's not saying, well, when, they're, when you're being attacked, just let it happen. Rather, this, this slap in, the Jesus, in Jesus' time was a cultural insult. And so he's painting a picture here of how kingdom citizens respond to personal offenses. He says that they're not the type of people who retaliate on a whim, but the sort of people who trust in God's justice. They trust and know that God's justice is perfect. They don't need to take things into their own hands. He says that this kingdom citizen will not only receive the insult peacefully, but is able to look past the offense to the human on the other side of it. And he goes further still, past force giving to radical generosity. He says in verse 42, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. I don't see any caveats here from Jesus. Don't give them money because they'll use it for alcohol. I'm not suggesting that we don't practice wisdom in our giving. I'm just pointing out that Jesus doesn't add qualifiers. He simply says that we are to be shaped by the love of God and, and it yields radical generosity. Kingdom citizens shaped by the love of God are genuinely invested in the needs of others. They're ultimately not concerned with their needs because they have all they could ever need in God. They recognize what John the Baptist says in John 3, 27. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. I want want to share this illustration with you, but please hear this as a a prescription, not a, or a description, not a prescription. Um, It's like if you're walking down the street And there's a thief holding a weapon and says, give me your coat. It would be normal and reasonable to hear, to feel fear in that moment. But but I think what he's describing is 
you have this strange voice in your heart, probably the Holy Spirit saying, you know, it is cold. Maybe he needs a jacket. Again, illustrating the heart, not (laughs) giving an example of what you should go do. Don't look, you know, if you get robbed, you should call the police, okay? I'm not. (laughs) But isn't that how the Spirit works, though? Kind of able to take our eyes off of ourselves and our situation and go, man, I don't know, maybe, maybe he needs this coat. Paul carries the same thought in Romans 12, 20. He says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, he'll heap burning coals on his head. Jesus and Paul are both saying that as you're being shaped by the love of God, responding to anxious aggression with a calm presence is either going to lead to disarm them with the confusion of your generous response or to you being in glory with God, come what may. If it sounds counterintuitive, good. It's a kingdom not like ours. It's a kingdom where Christ reigns. In my preparation this week, much of the help and clarity I gained on this passage, I owe to Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy. And so I'm, I'm going to call this reading an excerpt rather than a quote. Um, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's, it's worth it. Hear what he writes. Here we must once again recall the point about order that we have already heard and received the word of the kingdom and that anger, contempt, and absorbing desire have been dealt with so that our lives are not being run by them. If they occasionally test us still, that is very natural, but they do not control us and leave us unable to reliably and happily carry through with our sober intention to do what is good and avoid what is evil. This being so, when we are personally injured, our world does not suddenly become our injury. We have a larger view of life and our place in God's world. We see God. We see ourselves in his hands. And we see our injurer as more than that one who has imposed on us or hurt us. We recognize his humanity, his pitiful limitations shared with us. And we also see him under God. This vision and the grace that comes with it enables the prayer, Father, forgive them, for they do not really understand what they are doing. And in fact, they don't, as Jesus well knew when he prayed this prayer over his murderers. And it's with this that we're brought to the heart of Jesus' teaching, what real love is. Look at verse 43. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so finally, we arrive at this this final, you have heard it said, statement. It hit me yesterday in the middle of this, that he never says, "You've, you've seen it written. These are misinterpretations. You've heard it said, like a terrible, bad, life ruining rumor. Jesus here denies yet another wrongful interpretation of the law. The Old Testament never said to hate your enemy. They heard, you shall love your neighbor, and amended it with this caveat that your enemy is not your neighbor. And we all have heard the story of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus illustrates, yeah, your neighbor is everyone around you. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He says that kingdom citizens who are shaped by the love of God will reflect the grace that they have been shown. They know that God shows grace to all, so they cannot withhold that grace from anyone. And he closes this thought out by pointing out that people shaped by the love of God will look different than the world around them. As if it wasn't clear enough yet, we look at verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And so Jesus closes this section off with a verse that's been very widely misinterpreted. The two most common errors are, of course, the extremes, right? One error is to take it too lightly and and think that Jesus is just exaggerating again to prove a point. He doesn't really mean that we're to be perfect. And the other is to take it too intensely and say, well, we must be sinlessly perfect. Here's why both of those are wrong. They are once again assuming wrongly that Jesus is giving a new law. And he's not. He came to fulfill the law. And we have to remember what started this entire portion of of his message. 
was Matthew 5.20. It says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We need a righteousness not our own. Jesus came to rescue all being led astray by the scribes and Pharisees. He gives this message as a, a, a great proclamation that says, that's not what the kingdom is like. This is the heart behind him flipping tables in the temple and saying, you've made my father's house a house of thieves. No, he says, the kingdom of heaven will be different. God's not just going to turn you into cold-hearted rule followers. You're going to be a people made perfect. Oh, that the Spirit would illumine our hearts to see it. Can we just look, can we zoom out and look at this passage? Can you see Jesus in every illustration he laid out? Who would stay committed to the covenant of marriage, never leaving his bride, the church, but laying his life down for her? Who is the truth, the life, and the way? Who is the one that, who does not rely on his own testimony, but that of his father? Who is the one that would have his tunic taken? Who is the one who would receive unequal measures of justice on our behalf? Who would be insulted, accused, mocked, beaten, and forced to carry a cross? Who is the one who would take that cross miles out of town on the hill of Calvary? Who would go further than asked, further than forced, and carry our shame, our guilt, and our sin all that way. Who is the one who did not consider being God a thing to be grasped, but came to earth to sinful beggars like us? Who is the one who would love his enemies to death and pray, Father, forgive them? His name is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He fulfilled the law and went further to conquer sin and death. He rose from the dead, and he's alive today. He has saved us and is saving us. And we will be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect because of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. What hope we have. Man, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Dallas Willard's last in his chapter on our passage, he concludes with this very helpful question. Is loving like this hard to do? I love how he answers this because we're still even, even after we hear that epic hope, we all have this burning question inside us. Okay, what do I have to do? When we should instead ask with curiosity, what, what will it be like the more and more that we are transformed by his love? This is, what, this is what Dallas Willard has to say. When Jesus hung on the cross and prayed, Father, forgive them because they do not understand what they are doing, that was not hard for him. What would have been hard for him would have been to curse his enemies and spew forth vileness and evil upon everyone, God and his enemies, God and the world, and those who crucified him like the way they did, at least for a while. He calls us to him to impart himself to us. He does not call us to do what he did, but to be as he was, permeated with love. Then doing what he did and said becomes the natural expression of who we are in him. Kingdom citizens are shaped by the love of God. Four questions for application. First, how can we cultivate a deeper sense of God's love in our lives, and how might this shape our interactions with others? Second, in what ways can we demonstrate forgiveness and reconciliation in our relationships, even in difficult circumstances? Number three, how can we extend compassion and understanding to those who have hurt us, or whom we find challenging to love. Each question gets more fun. Uh, And number four, am I, are we becoming more loving? Where can I see the love of God transforming my heart? What specific fruits are clearly from above and not my own posturing? And what would my community say about this? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the gift that it is to to receive the work 
to study your word. God, thank you so much for seeing us. Everything you give is good. And it's so good, Lord, that sometimes it's hard to receive because we, we're just an untrusting people. God, you've never broken a promise. You've always been faithful. And we can always look to Jesus as our ballast of assurance that you are good and you are for us and you love us. So God, I just ask more than anything that would happen today, Lord, that if someone has been, has felt far off from you, God, that they would come near, that you would draw them in, not out of a spirit of condemnation, maybe a spirit of conviction, but Lord, more than anything, that just a little bit more, we would have a a grasp of your love for us. And we don't have to try to be transformed by your love because your love transforms us. Draw us into that, we pray. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.